Hello, good morning. Hopefully I won't be that abrupt, but you never know. Good morning, everybody. Hey, um, just before I get into my sermon, I wanted to say, um, that was a great video Cassie did, our kids' ministries team lead, and um, I'll give a little bit more of an update in our brief annual meeting after this gathering, Um, but for here now, I would just want to say thank you to all of you who are participating in that, prayerfully, financially, all of that. Uh, We're looking forward to um, a new building. That would be wonderful. Help us, Lord, right? Good. Um, So we're, we're back in, continuing in Matthew 26 today. And so uh, you can turn in your Bibles to that. Believe it or not, today we're going to be talking about words. We're using words to talk about words. Words are, words are interesting, aren't they? They mean things. Compound words. This is, this is the, some of you, like, come on. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna, it's going to be a really good day today, right? <laughs> The next 45 minutes, uh, the clock's ticking. It's 44 and a half minutes now. I need you to stick with me. Today we're looking at, uh, for the sake of, um, compound words. They're interesting, right? Somewhere along the line, somewhere along the way, uh, it became acceptable in the English language to take individual words and jam them together and make a whole new word, right? Right? So a couple of examples. Um, the word backwoodsman. It's three words jammed together. Back, woods, man. And it's, it's not a difficult concept. It's a person who's from the back of the woods. Right? But you've got to get that compound word together for that to make sense. Here's one. Sounds like old English, but it's not. There to four. There to four. Until that time. It's very eloquent to say there to four. Here to four is also somewhat elegant. It's the opposite of there to four. Here and there, you get it, right? So until that time is there to four. Until now is here to four. Okay. How about this one? Counterclockwise. Pretty simple. Unless you've only ever seen a digital clock then it would make no sense at all. In so much. In so much. Yeah. To such an extent. Here's one. Whatchamacallit. (laughs) Just kidding. That's not actually a word. If it was, it would have a synonym. Who's he, what's it? Also not a word. But here's the real one that we're actually going to look at today. Nevertheless. One word, three words jammed together, never the less. And if you have your notes, either digital wise or in your program, you see the title of the sermon might be a typographical error because it's three words, that one word pulled back apart to its original state, never the less. Less, but it's not a typographical error. We've got to look at this because words mean things. Strange, though, isn't it? Never. At no time. At no time. That's what never means. The is just the definite article. And less in this context means something that's inferior. So literally, nevertheless, would be At no time, personalize it, at no time will I go with something that's inferior. Nevertheless. Dictionary definition, in spite of, right? Dictionary definition is being committed to something in spite of something else. So let's just look at that for a moment. The something else is actually important. The something else matters to us. But it doesn't matter to us as much as something does. The something else is actually inferior to the something. 
Which is why we will go with the something instead of that which is inferior to something else. Because we're committed to something in spite of something else. So we're never going to go with that which is inferior. It's a great word, isn't it? Nevertheless. It's actually the hinge pin term for our entire text today. So listen for it as we read it. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them. The them would be his 11 disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let's pray and commit this time to the Lord. God, in your... Uh, sovereignty and in your goodness, you have included this scene in your word. You have preserved this so that we could understand what Jesus went through and we could see this um, in a way that we would be able to love and appreciate our Lord for what he endured on our behalf. You've preserved this in your word, Lord, so that we could learn from our Lord Jesus and we could follow his example. So Lord, this day, would you teach us by your Holy Spirit to learn your ways? I ask that you would help me to convey this, te this truth, this teaching, and help all of us, Lord, to, to incorporate it into our lives. I pray for those who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, that you will um, help them, Lord, Help them to know that you love them, that you're committed to their well-being. Help them to know who Jesus is and give them grace. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so you caught it, right? Right there in the middle of verse 39, nevertheless, being committed to something in spite of something else at no time Will we go with the inferior? Jesus is teaching us here. And as we enter this narrative now, now we know as we've been walking through Matthew's gospel that Jesus, Jesus has been, he, he's been telling his disciples that this hour is coming. Well, now the hour's at hand, friends. He's been telling them that he is going to suffer. Now the suffering has begun. So as we get into this part of the narrative. We're going to learn some things uh, from the Lord, come to, as I hoped in my prayer, to love and appreciate him and to learn from his example. So as we get into this this morning, the first time, first thing that I want us to see is that in times of trial, we should have those closest to us close to us. In times of trial, have those closest to you close to you. This is what Jesus himself does. He wanted his companions with him in this hour of trial. Verse 36 says that he went with them to a place called Gethsemane. 
He took his close disciples with him to this place called Gethsemane, often referred to as a garden. Um, I don't believe the Bible actually calls it a garden, but nonetheless, the scene is following the Passover meal and the institution of communion. This is right on the heels of Jesus having told his disciples that one of them is going to betray them, and they all begin inwardly searching, thinking, is it I? And they ask Jesus that very question, am I the one that's going to do this? And, and then, of course, we get the disclosure that it's Judas, and that at that moment, Judas leaves. And so Jesus is left with his 11 disciples, and then he goes further and tells them that they're all going to fall away. This very night, they're all going to abandon him. And of course, Peter, the vocal one, stands up, as we learned last week from Pastor Michael. And he said, Lord, Lord, I'm never going to do that. These other guys, they might, but I'm never going to. That's never going to happen. And then Jesus, of course, discloses to Peter that, that this very night, he's going to deny that he even knows him, which is unbelievable to Peter. He can't even imagine that that's, it's unthinkable to him. Nevertheless, so as the scene opens up, it's right after Jesus says all of this, and he wants these guys with him, his close companions, his disciples. He takes these 11 to this familiar location. Other gospel accounts tell us that Jesus often went here, which is partly why or how Judas knew where to find him which is next week's text. But he wants these guys with him in this place called Gethsemane. It's thought to be located kind of toward the base of the Mount of Olives. It's the, the place where they would press the oil out of the olives. So the big olive grove here, and this is that kind of inner place where they, where they took care of business. And this is the place that we find Jesus praying in agony and moments later being betrayed. These 11 disciples, these are close companions of our Lord. And he wanted them with him at this moment. He shared his life with these guys. These guys have walked with him now for three years, possibly a little bit longer than that. He loved these guys, and these guys loved him. And they're with him in this trial. At least up to this point, we have to give that to them. Up to this point, they're with him. And then we notice, as we look a little bit further beyond verse 36 into verses 37 and 38, we, we get this scene where Jesus, Jesus took his closest disciples even further. We don't know why. The Bible never actually tells us why did Jesus kind of create this inner circle? So he's, he had the 12. Well, we could back up a little, even a little bit beyond that. There were hundreds, literally thousands of people at this moment who would consider themselves followers of Jesus. At some level, a disciple of his. It wasn't just a few days earlier that these likely thousands of people welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem in what we know as the triumphal entry. For us, as we're walking through the text, it was actually months ago, but in the text itself, chronologically, it was just a couple days ago. These people shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're recognizing him as the Son of David, which would mean Messiah. So these, there's crowds of people that would say, oh, we're for Jesus. We're, we're followers of his. And then there's the 12 that Jesus perfect, purposely chose. But then there's these three, and we don't know why. Is there, is there an inner circle, Peter? And we're, and we're told in the text here that it's the, the sons of Zebedee. We know that's James and John, right? So you've got Peter, James, and John. Jesus takes them a little bit farther into Gethsemane. These are the same three that were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. We're never told why this is, but he had these three as his closest disciples. We're probably, that's not probably foreign to us, the idea that you can have friends, friends that you can 
spend time with and enjoy and, you know, have fun with or whatever. But then there's those friends that you can be particularly vulnerable with, people that you can open up and share your heart with that maybe you wouldn't with some of the other friends. And it doesn't mean that they, those people don't matter to you. There's just a different level of friendship with certain people. And this is exactly what takes place in this text. It's not to the crowds that Jesus shows, bears his soul. It's not even to the 11. And it doesn't mean those people don't matter to him, but for some reason, Peter, James, and John get this kind of full disclosure of what Jesus is actually going through. He tells his closest disciples that he's beginning to experience an agonizing sorrow. And he asks them to support him. He asks them to watch. Literally, stay awake, pray for me, because what I'm getting ready to do is beyond imagination. He took his closest disciples just a little bit further, farther. But then again, notice Matthew, as he's writing this out, we, we kind of see it unfolding. He's got the 11, then he takes the three, but then look at verse 39. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. So he lays out prostrate and prays. So, so he goes even farther he took the 11 to Gethsemane. He took the three into Gethsemane. But then he goes a little bit farther. Luke's version of the gospel gives us a description of that. He says, about a stone's throw. So as far as you could throw a stone, probably still within eyesight, probably steer, still within earshot. And it was that little farther that Jesus went where he met with his father. What are we talking about? We're saying in hours of trial, in times of trial, you and I need to be really wise to have those closest to us close to us. That's what Jesus does. He's close with his 11. He brings them. He's even closer with the three. He brings them even farther. But then he meets with his father, the one who is truly closest to. Oh, his earthly companions are very valuable to him. But his father is even more valuable to him. It doesn't lessen the value of those three or those 11 or the crowds. But he has a companionship with his father that's irreplaceable, that is, nece that is uh, necessary. And so he shares even more with his father. It's this moment, it's here that Jesus needed to be. The necessity of the, of the Gethsemane scene to set up what takes place next couldn't be overstated. It would be speculation to say, had Jesus not gone to Gethsemane, he, he would not have succeeded in his mission. That would be speculation. And we're not really wanting to speculate with regard to what may or may not have happened. We want to stick with the text. But the fact that this is here and Jesus says what he says is really important, friends. This is not a, a passing scene for us. The fact that Jesus goes farther and meets with his father is not a passing scene. This is the greatest hour of trial that any human has ever experienced up to this moment, and Jesus is experiencing it. And he needs to be with his Father. Normally, I, 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 leave, some I leave application to the end of a message, but I want to make some right now because it's important for us to grasp this. Again, this scene is really about what Jesus is doing, but we also want to glean from our Lord and learn his ways. If he needed people close to him, then we could easily say, sh sh so do we. If he needed his father, 
than most certainly we do. So by way of application, we need others. We need other people in our lives. There's never a concept anywhere in the scriptures that simply says, it's just me and God. That's not, a, that's not a concept in the Bible. We need other people. We need to cultivate community with other people so that we can be there for them and so that they can be there for us. It's one of the great necessities of life and one of the great benefits of being a part of a local church family. So some of you have been a part of City Point Church for a very long time and you've got deep relationships and you've got deep roots. You're living this out. Some of you are pretty new to City Point Church and you're still trying to investigate, is this going to be the place where I put down roots? Is this going to be, are these people my tribe? Are these the people that I can share life with? Can I count on these people? Will I let these people count on me? And those are great questions to ask, and they, they need to be searched out. You need to make it, you need to, at some point, as you're searching that out, at some point, you need to make a decision about that. And so when we talk about things like cultivating community or tapping into these natural communities that we're, that we're developing, if you're, especially if you're new, you must do that if this is going to be home, because being a part of a church is not simply about attending a gathering once a week. It's certainly part of it, but it's not, it's not the sole defining factor of what it means to be a part of a church. We need others. And we need God even more. Right? That's what Jesus is teaching us in part that there are trials in life that are so great that even our closest companions can only go so far with us. And we need them to go that far for us, no doubt. We need their support. We need their prayer. We need their counsel. But then there's times when we just simply have to go a little farther and meet with God. And in cultivating community, we need to be sure that the relationship that we have with God is the primary relationship. Unfortunately, as we see, as we will see from the text, the disciples, they didn't, they weren't who Jesus needed them to be at the moment. <laughs> And that's not the first time Jesus' disciples have fallen short and not been who they needed to be in the moment, right? Yeah. So this is what we begin to see. As this scene is unfolding, Gethsemane, Jesus wanted his closest companions close to him. So he teaches us this. In this next section, here's what we're going to see. That when your desire and God's will differ, go with the latter. Now, I know it's a very rare occasion for us humans where what we want and what God wills are a little bit different. We get that. It's pretty rare. doesn't happen all that often. Some of you probably never experienced that. You're like, really? That happens? Yeah. All that's called sarcasm. You get it. It's something that we experience to a greater or lesser degree on a daily basis. There's probably not a day in our lives that go by where what we want and what God wills is different. It's just part of life as a human being in this fallen planet. And when our desire and God's will differ, we should go with the latter. Right? Jesus wanted God's will more than he wanted his own desire. And that's hard to grasp, isn't it? There's some, real, there's some real touchy theology in play at this moment. And of course, with theology, you've got to be super precise. That matters a lot. Are we to think that 
what Jesus wanted and what God, his father, wanted were different. We thought they were one. We thought they were in agreement. Well, yeah, they are. Then what are we to make of this whole nevertheless thing? Not my will, but yours. Ah, let's look at this. First thing we see, look at verse 38. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. So he's, Jesus' sorrow, he's beginning to experience a sorrow that is hard to find words for. I use the word excruciating. As the cross looms over Jesus, he knows what's coming. The disciples are relatively clueless even though he's told them four times. They don't, they, it just doesn't, they can't grasp it yet. It's beyond their imagination. But as, it, but as it gets closer to the moment, Jesus begins to grieve deeply. It's an agonizing grief that carries this idea of being horror struck and despondent. Now he claims that it's so distressing that he could die. And there are some who, who go, oh, ah, Jesus talked in hyperbolic terms. He taught hyperbole a lot. Maybe he's just exaggerating to prove the point like he's done at other times. Is that the case here? I, I don't think so. I don't think that's what's taking place here. He tells Peter and the sons of Zebedee, my soul is very sorrowful. I'm experiencing, experiencing an excruciating sorrow. So much sorrow, so harsh and heavy that it could lead to death itself. It's partly why he's going a little farther. It's partly why he needs to get closer to his father because of what he's experiencing. It's not probably just hyperbole. I, I wanted to know if there's, I joked in the first gathering about, you know, we follow the science, right? But that was an untimely joke. <laughs> it's like, oops, I didn't mean that. But I actually looked into this. Like scientifically, can a person die from being sad? Is that possible? Well, a According to the science, it's true. I read, a, I read one account in the, the, from the Cleveland Clinic, kind of a renowned place, and they said, yes, a person can die from a broken heart. It's called broken heart syndrome. Where did they get that name? I don't know. But it, but it happens in an extremely traumatic, it's, 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 it's very rare, but when somebody experiences an extremely traumatic event, it triggers a surge of stress hormones in their body, which can put a person into short-term heart failure. And if not caught and treated, it can actually lead to death. Very rare, but it's possible. And if that's possible for everyday, run-of-the-mill human beings... As terrible as some of the stress and, and trauma that we experience can be, without in any way devaluing that or lessening that, what Jesus is experiencing at this moment is incomparable. They're not the same. They're not even close. So when he says, my soul is very sorrowful even to death, I don't think it's hyperbole. I think he literally is saying, I could die from the amount of sorrow that I'm carrying right now. I need you guys to watch with me. I need you to pray with me. And I got to go and meet with my father because this is brutal. Luke gives us a little bit more of a scene here when he talks in his gospel about how Jesus, his prayer was so intense. Luke says that he was, his sweat was like drops of blood. And again, people don't necessarily want to own that. And we think, well, by, this, by the 
the fact that the word like is there, this is a simile. It was kind of like that. But I don't think so. Because this too actually can happen. It's caused by extreme anguish where the blood vessels that surround the sweat glands, there's so much pressure that they actually rupture and the blood mixes with the sweat as it comes out of the pores of the skin. It's called hematidrosis. It's very rare. But if any other human being could actually ever experience these two things, it's incomparable what Jesus is experiencing, friends. He's sweating drops of blood and his sorrow is so excessive that he could literally die from it. And that's why he's praying. That's why he needs these guys to be with him. Then you think, well, what is he so upset about? Now, we know the end of the story. Most of us, we've read through one of the gospel accounts or seen a movie or whatever. We know what happens, but we can gloss over it and become kind of numb to the reality of what actually took place, and we miss it, why Jesus is so upset. But before we get to that, we've got to go back to these disciples. These disciples. So he's... He's told them, please, watch with me. I need you to pray. And he goes a little farther. And then after praying, he comes back and it says that he finds the disciples sleeping. And the question that he asks Peter, he's probably speaking to all of them, but he's addressing Peter as kind of the leader of the three And it's a haunting question. So could you not watch with me one hour? After I told you what I'm going through, I opened my soul up to you and told you what I'm going through. You couldn't stay awake for an hour and support me in this? I mean, just talk about an epic failure. That feels as bad as Peter's denial, as the abandonment. I mean, it's like the abandonment has already begun, friends. These disciples, those who are closest to Jesus, didn't help him when he needed them. They weren't there for him. Again, it's not the first time or the last time Jesus' disciples weren't weren't there for him. Most people, I mean, just looking at this scene, like most people given the option between praying and sleeping, choose the Sleeping option, right? We know that. We have good intentions, but that snooze button. I mean, we mean well, but we're just so tired. You know what I'm saying? The spirit is willing, Jesus says. That, that part of us that communes with God, it's willing, but our bodies Our physical bodies and our minds are so weak. Our resolve is just, ah. I mean, when we think about where these disciples are at at this moment, it's kind of understandable to a degree, right? It's been a very taxing season for them. Oh, the things that they have gone through over the last several weeks have been very taxing. Remember when Jesus said, we got to go back to Jerusalem, Thomas spoke up. And said, wait a second, we're going to die there. And they went anyway. So it's been a very taxing season for them, no doubt. It's now the middle of the night. Everything that Jesus did in, that's recorded in John 13 through John 17 happened right before this. Jesus, they shared Passover, communion, all of this teaching. It's the middle of the night in a very taxing season. Of course they're tired. And one other gospel account says that they weren't just weary, but that they were exhausted from sorrow. You know how tired you get when you're really sad? When you just have been crying your eyes out? Think about what Jesus just told them right before this scene. 
And we don't know how much time has lapsed. They're in this garden, in this place called Gethsemane for, at, I don't know, roughly an hour. Could you not pray with me one hour? We don't know exactly, but they're exhausted from sorrow. So, I mean, we kind of could give them a pass and go like, well, we get it. They're really tired. They fell asleep right when Jesus needed them. It doesn't feel good, does it? But we're still talking about when your desire and God's will differ, go with the latter. Yeah, we're going to get there because here's what we find. Verse 39, verse 42, again, hinted at in verse 44 is this praying that Jesus does. His desire was to find another way. That was his desire. And it's very clear in the text. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If it be possible. In his anguish, he expresses this to his father three separate times over the course of, I guess, an hour. What is this cup that he's speaking of? This cup, if possible, could it pass from me? Jesus is clearly begging his father to be spared from something. What is it? John Stott, in his epic work, The Cross of Christ, defined it as this. This cup was the spiritual agony of bearing the sins of the world and of enduring the divine judgment that those sins deserved. And, and again, we could look at that and, and go, oh yeah, that's, that's good, that's truth, that's quotable. Thanks, John Stott. But we don't really tap into what's actually taking place where Jesus, 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body when he hung on the tree. So, so you think for just a moment, maybe some of you can relate to this, maybe some of you can't, but it, maybe, you, let's see. Think for a moment about a time when you were, you were conscious of the, of the will of God and the standards of God and the righteousness of God. And... You, and you did something, said something, did something, whatever, that was completely contrary to the will of God. You were very unfaithful to God, maybe to others. And then you became aware of how severe your failure was. And the weight of that, the sense of guilt, a sense of um, shame, of regret, fear, of rejection, anxiety, like fill in the blank, right? All of, this, all of this, what we experience when we become aware of our sin. One sin. And that's how we feel. It's not even possible for us to imagine feeling the weight of every single one of our own sins if we had to bear it in a moment. But the Bible tells us that Jesus took every sin that's ever been committed against God into himself. He who knew no sin became sin. That's what the scriptures say. Can we, we can't even imagine that, can we? So as John Stott says, it was the spiritual agony of bearing the sins of the world. Imagine what that would feel like. And Jesus is feeling like he's, his soul is very sorrowful, even to death, just anticipating that moment. He's not bearing the sins yet. He's just anticipating bearing those sins. And he feels like he could die. But that's not just... That's not what the, it's taking those sins, as John Stott says, and enduring the divine judgment that those sins deserved. That's the cup. In the Bible, the Lord's cup is God's wrath. It's a symbol. The cup of the, cup of the Lord is a symbol of wrath. It's the judgment of God poured out on sinful humanity who have become his adversaries. And in order to be the Savior, of sinful humanity, Jesus would have to take the cup of the Lord himself. The full weight 
of God's judgment against every sin ever committed. Now we know why Jesus is saying, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And yet we get this word next, that hinge pin word, nevertheless. And Jesus, our Lord, with all of that, being very aware of all of that, says, in spite of my desire, not what I will, but what you will. He's committed, friends, to something in spite of something else. He's committed to you. He's committed to us, friends. He says, nevertheless, because he's committed to us. He's committed to doing his Father's will, which was to make a way for us to be reconciled to God. There's no other way if it were possible. Another way would have been found, but there's no other way. God is not going to reduce his holiness. Justice is going to be served in this universe. And there's no other way. For salvation, for redemption to take place. And so Jesus says, nevertheless... I'm committed in spite of what I'm feeling right now, my desires. You see, Jesus res was resolved to accomplish his Father's will. Not as I will, but as you will. That's why he's praying, friends. He was committed to his Father's will in spite of his own desires. Two things are true simultaneously. One, he did not want to experience the necessary suffering. And at the exact same time, he wanted to please his Father, which required the suffering. Jesus was committed to his Father's will. And nevertheless, remember how we're using that term. At no time will I go with the inferior. My desire is inferior to God's will, and I will go with God's will and never the less. Here's our big idea this morning. Like Jesus, you and I must commit to God's will and never the less. Nevertheless, friends, what Jesus does here is paramount. But it's by his example, he paves a road for us in a way of thinking that we, that we should not just be encouraged by, but become resolved over. Anything that's different than the will of God is inferior to the will of God. And so, when we say, like Jesus, we need to commit to God's will and nevertheless, we're never going to, we, we need to establish a, a way of thinking that says, when we're faced with temptation, when we're faced with trial, when we're faced with compromise, when we're faced with whatever sort of decision that we go, it's God's will for me and nevertheless, I'm not going to go with something inferior. And so even in the preparations of this, I've been praying that that would become something that just kind of gets in our souls and we just remember, nevertheless, we're faced with a situation and we go, nevertheless, I'm not choosing less than God's will. Sometimes it's hard to discern God's will, but once we know what it is, then we should just, then we need to be a, the sort of people that say, nevertheless, it's God's will and nevertheless, at no time will we go with the inferior. Now, there's one more thing here that we see that we can learn from this text. And the last two verses point this out. And that is that once we've prayed through, we can stand tall. 
This is exactly what Jesus does. After pouring his heart out in prayer, Jesus gains the resolve to accomplish his Father's will. Now, Jesus prayed in order to express his desire to his Father. We get that. He's very raw. He's very real, as we should be. It's important for us to learn that we can and should share our hearts and minds with God, even when we know our hearts and minds are contrary to the will of God. In fact, that's probably the most important time to share it, which Jesus gives us this example. He's not failing by admitting that he does not want to take the cup of the Lord. He's expressing his heart to his Father. This is something that we need to learn, that we can pour our hearts out to God. He should hear from us. He can, friends, hear from us, the good, the bad, the ugly. We do not have to put on some sort of a facade. He already knows how we feel. But for some reason, Jesus gives us the example that you could vocalize it. Prayer is not just this one-way communication where we simply dump on God and then hope that he sees things our way. Jesus prayed in order to align his resolve to his Father's will, not just to express his own desire to his Father, but to then get his, his desire, his resolve to align with his Father's will. We could say that's probably the main reason why Jesus prayed. He needed his father to fortify him so that once he arose from prayer, he was fully determined. He was not going to shy away. He was not going to back down from the full challenge that was in front of him. The garden of the, 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 the Gethsemane scene exists because this is where Jesus, as the cross is looming, established his full resolve to be the Savior of the world. And again, we can learn something from this, friends. As we learn to follow Jesus, we need to learn how to settle matters in prayer. Sometimes we walk around indecisive, we walk around with low-grade anxiety. We don't know why, and I'm gonna say part of the reason why is because we don't press through and settle matters in prayer. We pour our hearts out to God. We offer our complaints to God, and that's all fine, but we don't stick around and let God change our hearts and minds, and we come to a decision where we say, well, I've heard from God. This is the way it is. That's a good place to be, friends. But, but often we don't, we don't practice that. And so we, we walk around without a steeled resolve. We're kind of waffling people because we, don't, we, we haven't settled ourselves to say for us, it's God's will and nevertheless. We're still, we're still kind of wanting the less. We're still wanting the inferior at times. We want our will. And so we're in this turmoil, and I'm saying we need to settle matters in prayer. It's partly why God has given us His Holy Spirit. But we've got to stick around for a while and let God steal our resolve to His will. And then when the matter's settled, friends, it's settled. We can walk in the freedom. We can, like Jesus, rise and say, our, my betrayer's at hand. You can face whatever comes because we know what the will of God is a certain conviction about that. So, let's wrap this up. We get it. We, we, we know this. From start to finish, the entire gospel account, including this text, Jesus is the hero. We get it, right? He is the hero. He's the one who forged the way. He became the Savior. And, While we'll never, be, we'll never do what Jesus did, we most certainly need to follow his lead. Because, as we see here, he's, he's teaching us by his own example that in times of trial, we should have those closest to us close to us. And, and that when our desire and God's will are different, we should go with God's will. And that once we pray, we can stand tall. Most importantly, 
we can say like Jesus, we need to commit to God's will and never the less. You know, it's interesting. Romans 12 describes God's will as good and acceptable and perfect. Those are all very pleasant words, aren't they? But we probably know from experience, and we certainly can see it here in this text, that not only is God's will good and acceptable and perfect, it's also at times difficult and painful and costly. But we could also add, worth it every single time. So for us, nevertheless. Nevertheless, friends. You with me? For us, it's God's will and never the less. Let's bow in prayer. I pray at this moment that God, by His Spirit, will be at work among us. Maybe for some of you, there's a friend who needs you right now. They're going through something. You maybe have known about it or you've got a hint of it and he's, the Lord is putting somebody in your mind right now and you need to be that close friend to them. Maybe for others, you've been let down like Jesus was by his disciples. You've been let down Somebody close to you, they weren't who you needed them to be. And I want to challenge you. Don't begrudge them. Don't reject them. Don't hold them at arm's length. Like Jesus, love them. And rely on the one person who will never fail you. And that's your father. Maybe for some of you right now, you're in an hour of trial, you're facing a decision, and you know what your desire is, and you know what God's will is, and they're not a match. Tell it to God. And then commit to his will, however long that takes. After I pray, I'm going to ask our elders and our pastors to come to the front of the auditorium here. And some of you maybe need somebody to pray with you right now, today. Like you're, you just need some, some prayer. So after we sing, and you just come up and, and let these guys pray with you. Maybe lastly, before I pray, I would say, you know, friends, sometimes God's will is hard to discern. It's difficult at times to know what to do in precise situations. But one thing for sure, one thing that you don't have to wonder regarding God's will is that Jesus is your Savior. He suffered and died and rose again for you. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, what he accomplished in his death and resurrection was for you. And if today that's real to you, you don't have to understand everything, but if today that's real for you, then as others are coming up and praying with a pastor or an elder, come up and have a pastor or elder pray with you and just tell them, today I want to trust Jesus for his salvation, for his forgiveness. Lord, thank you for your grace. We see your grace in this text today. Thank you, Jesus, that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thank you for being who you are. And would you help us, Lord? Help us to learn your ways, to follow your example. And steal our resolve, Lord. Fortify us. So that we can say with deep conviction, for us, it's God's will and nevertheless. Amen.
Let's stand and sing.